chapter 28, the reproductive system. In this chapter, we're going to cover the reproductive system of the male and the female without pregnancy. Chapter 29 is going to cover pregnancy and fertilization. So the reproductive system we're first going to talk about in general, and then um, we'll talk about male first, followed by female. So the reproductive system in male and female functions in gamete production. Um, gamete, of course, being a sex cell, whether that's egg or sperm. So the gametes are going to be produced, then stored, nourished by the reproductive system, and finally transported. Fertilization is defined as the fusion of a male and female gamete together to form what is called a zygote. Now we should remember that um, a human cell is made up of 46 chromosomes. So a male sperm will carry 23 of the father's genes and the female egg will carry 23 of the mother's genes. So when those two gametes combine, we have a 46 chromosome zygote, which will be exactly half mom and dad. Now that's about all we're going to say for fertilization right now, as we'll save that for chapter 29. So the reproductive system is going to include, whether in male or female, gonads, which would be either the testes or the ovaries, ducts, which will carry the gametes from the gonads out of the body, and accessory glands and organs that are going to contribute fluids to the reproductive system, and finally the external genitalia. So in males, the testes produce spermatozoa, and spermatozoa is a fancy word for sperm cell, a mature sperm cell, and men actually make about a half a billion every single day of their lives, and that of course is average. There's a high end and a low end to that. And they're expelled from the body in semen during ejaculation. It's important to know that the sperm cells are the actual tadpole-like cells in the semen, which is the fluid that surrounds and nourishes those cells. So when we say semen, um, it only refers to just the fluid part of ejaculate. Females, the ovaries produce oocytes. An oocyte is an immature egg, and it's also important to know about the difference between female and male is that males produce sperm every day once they release puberty all the way through their entire lives, whereas females only make eggs before they're born. So a baby girl on her very first day of life already has all the eggs she will ever have in her entire lifetime. She will never make new ones and those eggs will lie dormant until she reaches puberty when they will begin releasing one a month throughout her reproductive years. But girls do not make new eggs once they are born. They only have the ones they're born with. Once those eggs are released during each month's ovulation, the egg will travel along the uterine or fallopian tube toward the uterus, and the vagina connects the uterus with the exterior of the body. So for females, we're going to get into them in detail in the last half of the chapter. So we'll start out with males first. The reproductive system of the male begins by talking about the pathway of sperm. Um, and in your notes that I've given you, on your outline you have a little acronym, 7UP. And 7UP, each one of those letters, stands for a part of the pathway of sperm production and release. So let's start with the S and we'll fill that in with seminiferous tubules. Okay, seminiferous tubules. Seminiferous tubules are located inside the testicle and in this picture right here we're looking at a mid-sagittal section of the male pelvis and we can't actually see inside of the testicle in this picture but the seminiferous tubules are tiny little coiled up tubes that are located inside the testicle and those little tubes are where sperm production first begins. Once the sperm 
are formed in the seminiferous tubules, they then will move to the E part of 7-up, which is the epididymis. And that's what this is right here, the structure that hangs on to the back of the testicle. Now, of course, remember, we're only looking at half the picture. There is one testy here and one epididymis, but we know that there are two testicles, so that means there are also two epididymi, okay? So the epididymis is on the back of the testicle, and then once the sperm are produced and move to the epididymis, they will then enter what's called the vas deferens, which is the V in 7-Up, the V in 7-Up. Now your book has, has started adopting this new term, ductus deferens. I want you to know that ductus deferens is the same thing as the vas deferens, but I like to use vas deferens because it fits in our 7-Up. So the vas deferens is a series of tubes. There's one for each testicle, so we can see one here. It's a tube that goes all the way around the back of the bladder. Okay, of course, here's the bladder. So we're going all the way around the back of the bladder. And once we get through the vas deferens, the vas deferens then feeds into the ejaculatory duct, which is located right within the prostate. So the ejaculatory duct is the second E in seven ejaculatory duct. And then the ejaculatory duct will feed into the next thing, which is the urethra. You notice we skip N. N stands for nothing in 7-Up. It just helps us keep the 7-Up name. So we had ejaculatory duct, we skip over N, and we go to urethra, and the urethra out through the penis, which is the P, okay? So one more time, we start in the testicle where the sperm is produced. We move into the epididymis, vas deferens, all the way around the back of the bladder, ejaculatory duct, urethra, and out the penis. And that seems like quite a loop and quite a quite a trip, but it actually makes sense because it takes several weeks for sperm to fully mature, enough to where they're able to fertilize. So that long pathway gives sperm time to become mature before they're actually released. So now that we know the pathway of spermatozoa, which again are mature sperm cells, we then have to talk about the accessory organs, and there are three groups of accessory organs. We have the seminal vesicles, the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bulbo-urethral gland. So we'll take a look at where those three are, and then a little bit later we'll talk about what they secrete. The scrotal sac encloses the testes, and of course the external genitalia being the penis. So in this picture here we can see the prostate gland, which we learned about in the urinary system, is right below the bladder. Then we have the seminal vesicles, of which there are two on the back of the bladder here, and the bulbo-urethral gland, which is located right there. Okay, so those three accessory glands. So we'll first talk about the descent of the testes. When a baby fetus is forming, a baby boy, his testicles actually start up very high in his, in his abdomen, up near the kidneys, which is certainly a long way from where they should be. So as uh, fetal development continues, the testes should descend into the scrotal sac. So we'll look at a picture of how this happens. Now, this is a two-month-old fetus, okay? So this is not a two-month-old infant. This is a two-month fetus, so very tiny, maybe the size of a peanut. And this is the pelvis that you're looking at here, okay, in the umbilical cord. There's the testicle way up near the kidney, and there's the scrotal sac way down here. Now, there's a cord that attaches the testicle down into the scrotal sac. Um, and that cord has a very ridiculous name, gubernaculum testi. And that name, as bizarre as it is, is the cord that actually attaches the testicle to the scrotal sac. 
Now, when you look at a picture like this, it sort of looks as though maybe that gubernaculum testi will shrink and kind of reel in the testicle to the correct location. But that actually is not at all what takes place. The gubernaculum testi never changes in length, but the baby's pelvis enlarges and lengthens. So this will allow the testicle to end up in the right place at the end of fetal development. We know this because we can see at two months this right here is the measurement of the length of the gubernaculum testi, five millimeters, which is quite tiny. Here we are at three months fetal development. The testicle is much lower. The gubernaculum testi still measures five millimeters. The baby's body has just gotten bigger. And at birth, right before the baby's delivered, we still have a gubernaculum testi and it's still five millimeters in length but the baby's pelvis has gotten much larger and has lengthened, which has allowed the testicle to end up in the right place by the time birth occurs. This is a frontal view of the same process. We can see how the gonads or testicles are way up near the kidneys. But as the months pass, the testicles begin to descend, descend, and descend until at birth they should be located within the scrotal sac. So there is a very important set of muscles in the scrotal sac, and the first is the dardos muscle. The dardos muscle wrinkles the scrotal sac, um, and what it's basically doing is the wrinkles in the scrotal sac, um, that muscle bunches up the skin, and so it's basically a storage area for the skin that's not used when there is not an erection. When there is an erection, there is a need for more skin. So when the skin is not in use, the dardos muscle wrinkles it and holds it, bunches it up on the scrotal sac. The cremaster muscle is a very important muscle because it's, it's a skeletal muscle and it actually pulls the scrotal sac close to the body in response to temperature. The testicles need to be at least two degrees Fahrenheit, lower than body temperature in order to have healthy sperm count. So if it is extremely cold, the cremaster muscle will pull the scrotal sac close to the body to keep it warm. If it's very warm, the cremaster muscle relaxes and allows the scrotal sac to drop away from the body, which keeps them from overheating. So that muscle on its own will help to determine whether or not the cremaster muscle or whether or not the scrotal sac needs to be closer or further away from the body based on temperature. The testicles are also surrounded by a special membrane called the tunica albuginea. The tunica albuginea is a fibrous membrane that surrounds the testicle and divides the testicle into lobules. And the lobules are separated by septa. Okay, so we'll look at a picture of this so it'll make a little bit more sense. Now before we look at the testicle on its own, we can look at the musculature of the scrotal sac in this picture here. So here we can see this side's cut a little bit deeper. There's the testicle and the epididymis. On this side we can see the testicle is surrounded by a muscle which is colored in kind of a red. That's the cremaster muscle. Then we have the skin and right under the skin is the dardos muscle, the one that wrinkles the scrotal sac when the skin is not in use. Cremaster, dardos, then the actual skin. Okay, so if we look at this picture of the testicle, this is a picture of the testicles sliced transverse. Okay, so we can see inside each scrotal cavity. So here's the actual testicle, and we can see some space. This dark area is the scrotal cavity right around here. Then we have the cremaster muscle. We have the dardos muscle and the skin. Now if we focus on the testicle, we can see that the testicle is surrounded by a membrane called the tunica albuginea. And that tunica albuginea actually pushes into the testicle and divides the testicle into lobules. And you can see almost like the segment of an orange in a way, little triangular sections. 
Each one of these lobules or triangular sections is filled with seminiferous tubules, which was the S in our 7-up that we talked about when we talked about sperm production. Those little coil-up tubes are where sperm production actually takes place. Okay, so we have the S for 7-up, the first S, seminiferous tubules, located in the lobules of the testicle. So in the seminiferous tubules is where sperm production takes place. Not only do we have sperm production happening in the testicles, but also sex hormones are produced like testosterone. Once the sperm are produced, they'll pass through what's called the reet testi into the efferent ductules, finally to the epididymis. So if we go back to this picture here, we can see the pathway. So we know that the first S is seminiferous tubule, which is what this is here. So once the sperm is produced, it will then be pushed into this area, which is called the reet testi. The reet testi will then pass the sperm into the efferent ductules and then the epididymis. Okay, so again, seminiferous tubules, reet testi, efferent ductules into the epididymis, which is the E, first E in 7-Up. So we're going to look a little closer at how this actually happens, and the process is called spermatogenesis, or the creation of sperm. And of course it begins in the seminiferous tubules, and it starts with stem cells called spermatogonia. Spermatogonia are stem cells that are constantly dividing. They're constantly making new sperm cells. The spermatogonia will divide and create new cells and those new cells will continue to change until they become mature sperm cells. So we'll take a look at that process. Along with the spermatogonia, we also have some special cells called sustentacular cells which are going to sustain and promote the development of sperm, sort of nourish them as they are developing. So let's take a closer look at spermatogenesis. We'll look, look inside the seminiferous tubule and you can see this on page 1047 of your textbook. This is a microscopic view of the seminiferous tubules that have been sliced. So we're taking one seminiferous tubule and we're blowing up the one seminiferous tubule to see how sperm are produced. And in this picture here, we can see that the sperm are being produced in the wall of the seminiferous tubule. So what I wanna do now is take this one little piece of wall right in here, and I wanna blow that up a little bit closer so we can see what's going on in these cells. Okay, so in the seminiferous tubule, we have two areas we need to be aware of. This is the outside of the seminiferous tubule right here, and this is the lumen, which remember is the hollow inside of any organ, so this would be the hollow inside of the tube, and this is the outside of the tube. Down here at the very bottom is the spermatogonia, which are the stem cells, the ones that make new sperm, all down here, spermatogonia. Spermatogonia will divide to produce primary spermatocytes. Primary spermatocytes. Okay? Primary spermatocytes will become secondary spermatocytes, which are these guys here. Secondary spermatocytes become spermatids, which are these. And spermatids become spermatozoa, which are mature sperm cells. So we started at spermatogonia, primary spermatocytes, secondary spermatocytes, spermatids, and then spermatozoa, which are the mature sperm cells. But how do we go from spermatid to spermatozoa. As you can see, these guys don't look anything like these. There's no tail, there's no neck, there's no head. So there's got to be a lot of change that's going on between here and here. So we're going to look at that next. So each 
spermatozoon, and spermatozoon is one spermatozoa, one mature sperm cell. So each mature sperm cell has three parts, a head, a middle piece, and a tail. The head contains dad's DNA, 23 of the father's chromosomes packed into the nucleus. The middle piece contains mitochondria that are going to power the tail. Because we know sperm are very active, um, they use their little tails to swim and that's how they try to get to the egg. So the mitochondria need to be strong, um, producing lots of ATP for the tail to move. And the tail is the only flagella in the human body. All right, so in this picture, which is figure 2828, this is found on page 1051 of your textbook, and it shows how we go from spermatid to spermatozoa, to mature sperm cell, okay? So the main reason that there's such a big change is not only that we need the sperm to be mobile so that they can move through the female's body to get to the egg, but also, sperm need to be lightweight and very small. They have a long trip ahead and they don't need to be carrying around a lot of extra baggage. So when we start at this spermatid, you can see that the spermatid has a lot of organelles, a lot of cytoplasm, just a lot of stuff that it's got to haul around. And it has no way to move. There's no flagella. So as time develops, um, time goes through the spermatid to the spermatozoa, we're going to start kind of whittling down the body plan of this spermatid. We're going to start shedding off cytoplasm, which will include organelles we don't need. We'll continue to shed as we develop a tail. And once we've shed off all the extra organelles and all the extra cytoplasm, we're left with a mature sperm cell at the end of this process. And the mature sperm cell again has a head, which contains 23 of dad's chromosomes, a neck piece which has mitochondria that will make energy for the tail. But there are no other organelles involved in this sperm. There's no Golgi, there's no ER, there's no ribosomes, there's none of that stuff. All of those things will be supplied by the mother's egg. The sperm just needs to carry dad's chromosomes to the egg when the time comes. All right, so once the testes are once the testes produce mature sperm cells, the sperm will enter the first E in 7 up, which is epididymis. The epididymis is an elongated tube with a head, body, and tail region, and its job is going to be to monitor and adjust the fluid in the seminiferous tubule. It's going to store and protect the sperm cells and also give them time to mature. Once the sperm cells move into the epididymis, they're going to spend about two weeks getting through the epididymis, which is a maze of tubes. And that two-week period will allow the sperm to start maturing even further to become prepared for when they might possibly enter the female's body. So this is a picture of the testicle and epididymis on page 1052 of your textbook. Here's the testicle course and the outside of it is covered with the membrane, the tunica albuginea. Each one of these is a lobule that contains seminiferous tubules. The seminiferous tubules will produce sperm and push them into the reet testi where they go through the efferent ductules into the epididymis, which is this area here on the back of the testicle. So once the sperm enter the epididymis, they'll take two weeks just to get through this one little epididymis before they enter the vas deferens, which is the V in 7-up. The vas deferens begins at the epididymis and passes through the inguinal canal and enlarges to form the ampulla on the back of the bladder. The ejaculatory duct at the base of the seminal vesicle and the ampulla will join together and form the urethra. 
Okay, so we're going to go back so that I can show you the vas deferens and how it joins together with the seminal vesicle into the ejaculatory duct. And we'll take two views of this. So here comes the vas deferens around the back. And it joins with the seminal vesicle, which we haven't really talked about yet. This is a gland and the ejaculatory duct and then feeds into the urethra and out. So let's take a view of the back of this right here so we can see it a little bit more clearly. Okay, so this picture is on page 1053 of your textbook and it shows how all of these tubes join together. So we have here the vas deferens from one side and the vas deferens from the other testicle. The vas deferens enlarges on both sides to form what's called an ampulla. Okay, it's a swollen portion of the vas deferens. The two swollen ampulla join together with the seminal vesicle glands. Okay, so we've got a gland here and a gland there. All four join together to form the ejaculatory duct, which runs right through the prostate. The ejaculatory duct then becomes, or then feeds into the urethra, which will exit the body. Okay. So the urethra has three regions, has three regions, the prostatic, membranous, and penile. So if we look at all three of those regions, we can see why they each have their names. The prostatic urethra, of course, is going through the prostate. The membranous region is in between the prostate and the penis. And then this is the penile urethra. So penile, membranous, prostatic. All right, the accessory glands. There are three sets of accessory, accessory glands, starting with the seminal vesicles. The seminal vesicles are a very active secretory gland, and they contribute, even though they're not very big, they contribute about 60% of the total volume of semen. The seminal vesicle fluid contains three major things, fructose, which is sugar, prostaglandin, and fibrinogen. Fructose, or the sugar, in this secretion is going to give the sperm mitochondria the sugar they need to produce energy, or ATP. The prostaglandin will cause contractions in the male and female reproductive tracts. So prostaglandin will cause spasming of the male reproductive tract, helping to get rid of all the semen. And once the prostaglandin actually enters the female's body, it causes her vaginal canal to contract, which will pull more semen in. The, the thought is to increase the chance of pregnancy. And fibrinogen causes a temporary clot of semen in the vagina. So the semen thickens up when it enters the vagina because of fibrinogen, which helps more of it stay in the vaginal canal, less of it can run out. The prostate gland secretes slightly acidic prostate fluid, and it contributes about 20 to 30 percent of the secretion. Um, and the fluid is slightly acidic, which the prostate, um, it's not fully understood all the functions that it may have, but one thing that we do know is that the prostate um, is likely one of the reasons that men are less likely to develop uh, urinary tract infections because the prostate acidic fluid um, can inhibit bacterial growth. The bulbourethral glands, which secrete around 10% um, of the semen, is an alkaline mucus with lubricating properties. Bulbourethral fluid is what's often referred to as pre-ejaculatory fluid. It's kind of a clear mucus and the bulbourethral fluid, what it does is it actually coats the inside of the urethra before ejaculation. 
And the idea is to lubricate the penis, but to also neutralize urinary acids. Because remember, men use the urethra for urination and also ejaculation. So if there is a urinary acid residue in the urethra, it could potentially harm the sperm when the sperm move through the urethra during ejaculation. So the bulbourethral glands are going to neutralize the acid to create a safe, a safe passageway for the sperm when they actually come through. So the typical ejaculate is only two to five milliliters of fluid. And it contains between 20 to 100 million sperm per milliliter. So that could be, on the high end, 500 million sperm per ejaculate. Now, whenever we call a man sterile, a lot of times people think that he has no sperm in his semen, but that's not actually true at all. It just means that the sperm count is so low that the chance of any sperm actually making it as far as the egg are very slim. And we'll talk about why that is when we get into reproduction in chapter 29. So overall, seminal fluid is a distinct ionic and nutritive glandular secretion. Overall, semen would be considered extremely basic. And the reason for it, and when I say basic, I don't mean simple, I mean basic on the pH scale. It's considered basic because the female's body is terribly acidic. So without the coating of semen around the cells, the female's acidic vaginal canal would likely kill many of the sperm and make it less likely for pregnancy to occur. The male external genitalia consists of the scrotum and the penis, and the skin overlying the penis resembles the scrotum. The penis contains three masses of erectile tissue two corpora cavernosa, and one corpus spongiosum. The dilation of that erectile tissue is what produces an erection. So if you look on page 1055, we can see how the spongy and cavernosa tissue is located inside the penis. So here we have these purple cylinders are the corpora cavernosa. Each one surrounds an artery, and below that we have the corpus spongiosum, which surrounds the urethra. So this, these three cylinders of erectile tissue, if we were to take a transverse section and look at that, that's what this is. We have corpora cavernosa, another corpora cavernosa, each surrounding an artery, and then below that is the corpus spongiosum surrounding the urethra. When these spongy tissues are engorged with blood, this is what creates an erection. Male reproductive hormones. First we have FSH, which is of course follicle stimulating hormone, and its job is to target sustentacular cells to promote spermatogenesis. LH will cause secretion of testosterone and other androgens. Gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to also help with um, sperm production. And testosterone is the most important androgen, not only because it assists in sperm production, but it also is going to give men their um, secondary and primary sex characteristics. Okay, so we'll now move into the reproductive system of the female, which is the second half of chapter 28, and it begins on page 1060. And if you recall, um, I believe in a couple of other chapters, or maybe one other chapter, I showed you some ads from the 30s, just to show you how far things have come. And this one says, you may think she's just your gal, but she may be everyone's pal. So prophylaxis prevents venereal disease. Nice way to say wear a condom, which is kind of forward for that time. And then this one is pretty awesome. This one shows how a woman, this woman here is held in a web of indifference. Her husband does not care about her. He's not interested in her. 
And the reason is not because of anything significant really, but because she has it douched with her Lysol. Because apparently Lysol used to be the doctor's number one douching agent. I cannot imagine how painful that would be, but apparently you didn't you could use it to disinfect your floors and also your vagina. So here we can see that after she's used her Lysol, she has now broken through the web of indifference and her husband is extremely interested in her again. So down here, many doctors recommend Lysol for feminine hygiene for six reasons and it just gives us one. Um, it's much safer, it says, than homemade douching solutions. For feminine hygiene, use Lysol. That is extremely ridiculous and there's no gynecologist um, in this time period that would ever suggest you use Lysol. Okay, so the main organs of the female reproductive system are the ovaries, the uterine tubes, which used to be called fallopian tubes. So I will probably always say fallopian tube, but your book is going to refer to it as a uterine tube. The uterus, and then of course the vagina or vaginal canal. The ovaries, uterine tubes, and uterus are enclosed within a broad ligament, and the mesovarium is going to support and stabilize the ovaries. So we'll look in a second at some of those ligaments and mesoveriums, but first we'll take a look at the basic female anatomy. So this is a uh, mid-sagittal section through the female reproductive tract found on page 1060. And we can see here, we've got the, the pubic bone there, the bladder, and the urethra. And then here, of course, we're only looking at half the picture. We've got a fallopian tube, ovary, pear-shaped organ, this is the uterus. And right here at the bottom of the uterus, this is the cervix, and then the vaginal canal right there. Okay, so we're going to look at these in steps. The ovaries are held in position by ovarian and suspensory ligaments, and blood vessels enter the ovary at what's called the ovarian hillis, and we've used that word many times at this point, so you probably remember that that's just where blood vessels and nerves enter an organ. And tunica albuginea, just like in the male reproductive system, is a membrane that covers the ovary. All right, so this picture is found on page 1061 of your textbook, and it is a picture of the uterus, which again is a pear-shaped organ. The uterus is almost entirely muscle. It's just a big, thick muscle. And then below that is the vaginal canal and the cervix, with the cervical opening right there. And of course, that cervical opening is where childbirth must occur. This is what dilates during labor. See how tiny enclosed it is, it has to get to be 10 centimeters open, which is extremely wide in comparison to what it normally is. Then up here we have fallopian tube on the left and fallopian tube on the right, and each fallopian tube is aligned with an ovary on both sides, and of course the ovary is where we're going to find the eggs that were already created when the female was first born. Here we have an ovarian ligament. This is going to attach the, the ovary to uterus. And this thing that looks like wings is the broad ligament on either side. And the broad ligament is going to anchor the uterus into the abdomen or into the pelvis. And the main reason for this is the uterus does a lot of moving around. Even during your menstrual cycle, the uterus is going to contract to help rid your uterus of the, of the blood that it doesn't need since pregnancy did not occur. And not only that, but when the uterus does become fertilized, or when we have a fertilization of an egg and we have an implantation of, of an embryo in the uterus, the uterus has to grow many times its size and we'll have a baby in there doing gymnastics. And so because of that, we've got to have this ligament to hold the uterus in place to kind of give it a little bit of anchorage as it goes through all these major changes. So oogenesis. Oogenesis is the production of the egg and we already alluded to that um, oogenesis occurs before a woman is ever born. 
So every newborn girl already has all the eggs she'll ever need for her entire life and she'll never make new ones. Now it is often said, it sounds, it doesn't sound very good, but it's, but it actually is, is good. Um, that for men, it's, it's quantity, not quality. And, and what that means is that men produce just ridiculous amounts of sperm um, their entire life. And they're occurred, they're, they're produced in such mass production that every single one of them can't be perfect. So even the most healthy of men do have some sperm that are not so great. Some that swim in circles or have big, big tails or tails that double tails that end up swimming and bumping into things. And those are sperm, of course, we don't want to make it. But that being the case, many of those sperm will die off as they begin to trek to the egg. So there's not, not every sperm is top quality. But for women, because we only make eggs once in our life, we have to take care that those eggs are as perfect as possible. So for women, it's about quality, not quantity. We have a fraction of the amount of sex cells that men have, but ours have to be perfect because we've got such a precious few. So once we have formed our eggs, which is before birth, then those eggs will lie dormant until we reach puberty. Once a girl reaches puberty, she will begin to release one egg a month in what we call ovulation. So this is going to uh, refer to our next thing, which is the ovarian cycle. The ovarian cycle is two phases. We have the follicular phase, which is pre-ovulation, and the luteal phase, which is post-ovulation. So the follicular phase, pre-ovulation, let's first remind ourselves, or if you've never heard this before, the female's reproductive cycle lasts approximately 28 days. 28 days on average. So thinking about the average female, pre-ovulation would be half of that, be the first half. So the first two weeks or the first 14 days. So day one up to about day 14 is pre-ovulation. Luteal phase is post-ovulation, which is day 14 and beyond all the way to day 28. So really, to be a little bit more accurate, day 14 is when we would expect ovulation or the release of an egg. So we could word that pre-ovulation day 1 through 13, ovulation day 14, and post-ovulation day 15 to 28. Okay, so we're going to start out with pre-ovulation and we're going to look at what's going on between day one and 13, which lead up to ovulation or the release of the egg. And once the egg has been released, we'll talk about what happens after the egg is released, if you get pregnant and if you don't get pregnant. So the ovarian cycle is going to cover some steps, the formation of the primary, secondary, and tertiary follicles. Then we have ovulation. And after that, the formation and degeneration of the corpus luteum and degradation of the corpus luteum. So we'll look at all these in a picture. All right, this is on, this is gonna be found on page 1063 of your textbook. And what we're doing here is we're actually looking at the cortex of the ovary. So the ovary has two parts. It has this outside perimeter, which is the cortex, and the inside is the medulla. So in the cortex of the ovary, if we take one little chunk and we blow it up, this is the cortex of the ovary, okay? This one little picture. And in the cortex, we can see some little structures here. These are oocytes. Oocyte being immature eggs. These are immature eggs. These are the eggs we've had since the day we were born, if you're female. These are called primordial follicles, okay? Now, the first thing we need to do is write down what a follicle is. A follicle is a secretory 
sac or gland. A secretory sac or gland. Each oocyte is surrounded by a follicle. The follicle is kind of a little, a little cushiony, pillowy sac that surrounds, protects, and nourishes the egg. So each one of these oocytes has around it a follicle, okay, that protects it. And this says primordial follicle because primordial means that it's been there since the beginning of your time. So since the day we were born, we've had those eggs. So this would be day one, okay, day one of the 28 day cycle. And there's going to be a spike in hormone around day one, and that hormone will be FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone, which makes sense because we want to stimulate those primordial follicles. So follicle stimulating hormone would be perfect for that job. So we'll have a spike in FSH, which will cause several follicles to become activated. Okay, so this is an example of what could happen. So here we have two follicles that have become activated. And each follicle contains an oocyte, all right? Notice that the follicles are primary follicles and the oocytes are primary oocytes. Now, the oocytes and follicles are not going to mature at the same rate, so we need to be careful to note when their primary, when their secondary, when their tertiary. So I'm going to be sure to point that out as we go down the line. So here we are at the beginning of the cycle, day one, and we're going to have a spike in FSH. FSH will cause the stimulation of some follicles. In this example, we have two. Each follicle contains an oocyte. So right now we have primary follicles and primary oocytes. You can see the faint outline of the follicle around the oocyte. One of these follicles will be selected to move to the next step. The other will disintegrate. So it looks as though this one is disintegrated and we're going to move this guy over to the next step. So as time continues on, this particular follicle and oocyte are selected to become the secondary follicle. So here we have a secondary follicle, which is a big, swollen follicle that's taken on a lot of fluid. And then we have in it the primary oocyte. Primary oocyte. So the oocyte's still primary, but the follicle is getting bigger and more swollen, and we now call it the secondary follicle. The secondary follicle then enlarges to become the tertiary follicle, which is huge. This is the tertiary follicle. It's accumulated a ton of fluid. And right here we have the primary oocyte. So the egg has still not changed any, no change. But the follicle has matured and matured and matured. So at this point, the tertiary follicle is so large that it will actually create a bulge on the surface of the ovary. And that bulge on the surface of the ovary can sometimes cause what we call ovulation pain. If you've ever had any tenderness or soreness around the time of ovulation around your ovary, this could be the reason why, because this, this swollen bulge can actually push on nerves in the pelvic region. All right, so here we are, we're creeping up on about day 10 to 12. Okay, so we started out down here day one, and as we've been developing, we're getting closer and closer to the magic day 14 when ovulation occurs. So about day 10 to 12, we're gonna have a spike in another hormone, luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone, or LH, causes ovulation. So once luteinizing hormone spikes, Luteinizing hormone is going to cause two major things. One, ovulation, but it's also going to cause the primary oocyte to become secondary. So we're going to have our first maturation. So here we are at ovulation. This is an actual picture of the surface of the ovary with the egg bursting out. Okay. So this is day 14 ovulation. 
the egg's going to pop out and as that luteinizing hormone caused the egg to mature, we now call the egg or oocyte secondary. So on day 14, it becomes secondary. And that little oocyte will begin floating down the fallopian tube for a possible chance at pregnancy. So we'll, we'll pick up there in just a minute. But as the egg pops out of the ovary and begins to move down the fallopian tube, the egg will leave behind some follicular cells. Those follicular cells will become what we call the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is a collection of cells that will release a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone will thicken the uterine lining in preparation for pregnancy. It will thicken the uterine lining in preparation for pregnancy. So if the uterine lining is becoming nice, thick, and rich with blood and nutrients, if that egg does become fertilized, then the uterus will be ready to accept the egg and to start the development of an embryo. So the corpus luteum will remain in the ovary until it's determined whether or not we're pregnant. Alright, so we've just covered pre-ovulation. That was day 1 to 14. And we're going to move now into a couple of parts of the uterine tubes and then we'll begin on post ovulation. So the fallopian tubes are divided into three areas. We have the infundibulum, the ampulla, and the isthmus. Infundibulum, ampulla, and the isthmus. And you can see those three uh, regions on page 1066 of your textbook. So we're going to take a look at those three regions and I'll point them out for you. They're also part of your lab. Okay, so uterus here. Then we have the fallopian tubes on either side and the ovary. So the three regions of the uterine tubes are, we have the fimbriae, which are the little finger-like projections on the end of the fallopian tube. The fimbriae are attached to the infundibulum. Then we have the ampulla and the isthmus, which is what's attached to the uterus. Infundibulum, ampulla, isthmus. The uterus is a very muscular organ that's going to mechanically protect, nutritionally support, and remove waste for the developing embryo and fetus. It's supported by the broad ligament and three pairs of suspensory ligaments. We, we looked at the, the broad ligament. So what this is saying is the uterus is used for nothing other than development of the embryo. This is a list of some of the major anatomical landmarks, which we will point out here in the next, next picture, which you can find on page 1067 of your textbook. Okay, in this picture we can see the uterus has been cut open so that we can see the inside details. We have here the uterine cavity, which is the hollow inside or lumen of the uterus. We have the fundus, which is the raised top superior portion of the uterus. Of course, fallopian tube, ovary, broad ligament. Then we have down here the internal os of the cervix, cervical canal, the exterior portion of the cervix where the cervical os is. That's where we have to have dilation for childbirth. And then the vaginal canal leading down from the cervix. So if we were to do a cross section through the uterine wall, okay, right here, if we were to cut a chunk through here, we would see three layers, the innermost layer, middle layer, and the external layer. This is the endometrium, myometrium, or muscle, and then the parametrium. So let's go back a little bit and look at that. So the myometrium is the muscular layer, and because the uterus 
is not under our conscious control. It's smooth muscle. The endometrium is the thin inner lining of the uterus. That's what changes in thickness to prepare for pregnancy, and it's also what sheds off when you have your period. The parametrium is a serosa that covers the outside of the uterus. Okay, so we can look at those three layers in this picture, which is on page 1068 of your textbook. So here's the lumen of the uterus, the inner layer of the uterus, and then or the hollow inside, and then we have the endometrium, which is the inner layer of the uterus, myometrium, which is all muscle, and then the parametrium, which is the outer covering or serosa of the uterus. Now we're going to talk about here in a second the uterine cycle, which is the menstrual cycle. And in order to understand it, a lot of times people want to know where does the blood come from and why does that happen? Well, once you've ovulated and the corpus luteum is released, that corpus or corpus luteum develops, the corpus luteum will begin to release progesterone, which thickens the uterine lining in preparation for pregnancy. So you can see here that the progesterone has thickened up, or the progesterone has thickened up the endometrium. This endometrium is nice, rich, thick, with nutrients and blood for a possible pregnancy, for a possible implantation of a little embryo. If you don't get pregnant, you don't need all of that tissue and blood. So there's no reason to maintain it. So what happens if you don't get pregnant is the corpus luteum will shrivel and die and then no more progesterone will be released. If progesterone is no longer released then the endometrial lining will not be maintained. And what happens is actually the blood vessels that feed into the endometrium, these blood vessels here, will pinch off or vasoconstrict, which will prevent any nutrients and oxygen from getting into the endometrial tissue. If you're not giving a tissue oxygen and nutrients, what happens to it? Well, it's going to die. So if the tissue dies, which it will, the tissue will begin to shed off. And when this tissue slides down and sheds off, it will leave behind broken blood vessels. And those broken blood vessels will begin to bleed. And that is the anatomy of a period. So the uterine cycle, which is found on page 1069, is a description of the repeating series of changes in the endometrium. And it continues from menarche, which is your very first period, to menopause, which can be your last. There are three steps to the uterine cycle, beginning with menses. Menses is when you actually begin the process of bleeding. Menses last anywhere from one to seven days. I've never met anyone with a one day period, so I don't know where your book gets that from, but we'll go with it. One to seven days would be considered normal. And in that time, women lose anywhere between 1.2 to 1.7 ounces of blood. Now the pain that's associated with, men, with menses is that the uterus is contracting, and that contracting is the uterus attempting to rid itself of all of the extra tissue and blood that's not needed, and the contracting will help you to lose that blood and tissue better, more efficiently. So after menses, when all the blood is lost, we then have what's called the proliferative phase where we begin to rebuild the endometrium to prepare for a new cycle. And then the secretory phase where the endometrium is at its thickest and most ready for implantation. So we can see that in this figure here, which is found on page 1069 of your textbook. Here is the uterus going through menses. We can see that the lumen is pretty empty and the endometrial tissue is very thin because we're shedding it out. Here is a picture of the uterus. As soon as menses is over, we begin going through proliferation, proliferation of the proliferative phase, where we begin to build up the endometrial tissue again. 
Secretory phase is when the endometrium is at its thickest in preparation for pregnancy. And when this phase is over, if you don't get pregnant, then we cycle back around and have a period and begin the process again. The vagina's major functions are passageway for elimination of menstrual fluid, receiving the penis during sexual intercourse, and forming the inferior portion of the birth canal. The external genitalia of the female includes the vulva, which the vulva is the word that describes all these things combined, the vestibule, the labia minora and majora, periurethral glands, clitoris, and the lesser and greater vestibular glands. So we'll go back to our original picture to look at some of those things. Okay, so we just finished talking about the uterus, the cervix, fallopian tube, ovary, and then we have the vaginal canal. Here's the clitoris. Then we have the periurethral glands on either side of the urethra. And then we have the greater vestibular gland which produces lubrication during intercourse. Here we have the labium minus and then the labium magus. And it's labia minora when you're talking about both of them and the labia majora when you're talking about both of them. But labium minus and labia magus when you're just referring to one. Mammary glands include the pectoral fat pad and a nipple surrounded by the areola, and they function in lactation under the reproductive hormones, under control of the reproductive hormones, which um, you can see a picture of this on page 1072. We will not talk about lactation until we get to pregnancy, so that will be covered in chapter 29. But in this picture here, we can see some of the major structures of the mammary gland. We have, of course, the, lac, um, the lactiferous ducts, the lobes of the mammary gland where milk is produced. We have the pectoralis major here, adipose tissue, the areola, and the nipple. Hormones of the female reproductive cycle control the reproductive cycle and coordinate the ovarian and uterine cycles. Key hormones of the female reproductive system include FSH, which will stimulate follicular development, LH, that helps um, with ovulation, estrogen has multiple functions like secondary sex characteristics, and progesterone, which can stimulate endometrial growth and secretion. The physiology of sexual intercourse. Now I think by the time we all get to the age that we are here, we should know how this works, so we're gonna go through it pretty quickly. Male sexual function. Arousal leads to erection, which can only occur under parasympathetic outflow which means that a man has to be relaxed in order to get an erection. This is also the cause of many of the nocturnal erections or erections that happen throughout the night. Um, a man has to be relaxed, meaning that if you are in sympathetic fight or flight mindset, as, as though you're being chased by an ax murder or something really extreme like that, and you can get an erection, then that's just extremely creepy and weird. So that should not be possible. Parasympathetic outflow um, means that the man must be relaxed in the rest and digest phase. Once erection occurs, emission and ejaculation then happens under sympathetic stimulation because once sex begins, of course, that is an excitable phase, so that would change from parasympathetic to sympathetic. Once sex occurs, then semen will be pushed towards the external urethral opening and detumescence is when the erection goes away, which is controlled by another charge of the sympathetic nervous system. 
In females, it's similar. Arousal causes clitoral erection. Vaginal surfaces are moistened. And parasympathetic stimulation causes engorgement of blood vessels in the nipples. This can actually cause what some people refer to as sex flush, which is a reddening of the chest. Aging. Menopause is the time that ovulation and menstruation tend to cease, which is typically around the age of 45 to 55, and it's accompanied by a rise in some hormones and a decline in others. It's sort of a screwy time for hormones, which can cause a lot of symptoms like hot flashes and mood swings and very emotional moments. Typically, there's a decline in estrogen and progesterone, but a rise in FSH and LH. And men have their own menopause. It's called the male climacteric. And this is when levels of testosterone begin to decline and FSH and LH levels rise, but there is a gradual reduction in sexual activity. And this concludes chapter 28.